Hello and welcome to a new video presented from Telescope Service and in this video I want to tell you some details about the 8900mm refractor and I will also give you a little, a very little introduction in visual astronomy how to set such a telescope up, how to start with astronomy and also what you can expect from it. So that means the video may be a bit longer than usual because I will explain the things that you have with the telescope, the accessories you get with it and how to use it. So I hope you are fine with that. But as usual, if I miss something, if you want to know something more, feel free to drop a comment or send us an email. I'm pretty sure we can answer your questions. Okay, so first of all, this refractor. What's the intention behind? It is a very cheap series of astronomical telescopes, so beginner level, really entry level telescopes. Um, it is common for people to give it away as present. Many people do this and this is especially a good idea if the person you're giving it to, or even if it's for yourself, uh, um, maybe you're not sure if astronomy is the right hobby, then you don't want to spend thousands of of uh, dollars or euros into uh, into the equipment so this one here is maybe a better starting point something around 200 euros plus minus depending on the situation of course okay so without further ado let's get started I think we start from the bottom to the top I will tell you all the details about it first of all you when you order this telescope you get it all in one package all these things uh, but you have to assemble it by yourself but this is not a not a big problem the tripod comes in, in parts so you have to assemble the tripod all is described in the manual English French and German is available and this is really straightforward you only need an Allen key all the other things are hand knobs so no tools really required so first you have to set up the tripod this is height adjustable, so depending on your own height, uh, you can adjust the height of the tripod that you get a convenient uh, position of the telescope itself. Then the next and maybe most interesting thing also on such a telescope is the mount. First of all, you may ask, why does a um, telescope mount look so weird? It's not like a photo ball head or, or gear head of a on, on a photo tripod but it's more more technical so this is called an equatorial mount uh, the thing is when having a standard photo tripod you have to move the telescope around two axes you have to move the altitude and the azimuth to follow a particular object in the sky you can do this this is okay the very cheapest telescopes have an azimuthal mount so this is, uh, in theory, it's okay, but the thing is, it is pretty difficult to track the telescope on these two axes. So some hundred years ago, uh, guys invented this uh, so-called German equatorial mount. And here the idea is that this axis, this axis here, points to Polaris, to the celestial pole, South Polaris also the same. And because all, all objects appear to move around the celestial pole, you now have to correct the motion only in this one axis. So you set a particular target in your telescope and then you can move only this axis and have it always in your field of view in the telescope. So no worry about uh, this height and azimuth adjustment. All other telescope mounts also their high quality the very pricey high quality mounts working after the same principle it's all the same for these mounts but then they are heavier to get it more stable and they are more precisely machined especially the gears and all the ball bearings and so on what's inside this mount what else to know so um, this axis has also a specific name. This is the right ascension axis. And 
on the top of this axis sits the declination axis. So you can imagine when pointing it like this, you're pointing exactly at Polaris or the North Celestial Pole and turning this turns the declination. So this is now declination around zero degree and even lower. Now how to set up this thing? Of course the mount comes pre-assembled. This is one block, This you can't uh, put it in smaller pieces. Um, you have to adjust the this axis exactly to Polaris. And it is a bit difficult if you haven't done it before. If you get used to it, then it's a no-brainer. Then you get it in a couple of minutes. So um, the first thing you have to do is you have to set your tripod level. Maybe you should carry a, a bubble level with you, which you can put on the top of the tripod to bring it level. That makes subsequent steps more easy. And then, and not locking this screw here, you can adjust the azimuth of the, of the mount. And when, when moving this, you can look uh, besides the mount to Polaris to bring it in the near of the celestial pole. More high quality mounts, the bigger ones have a polar finder scope. It, it's just a little telescope which is integrated in this axis and looks through the declination axis to get it point on. This is not available with this very small EQ2 or so-called EQ3-1 class mount. And then when you have it, lock it in place. And the next thing is you have to adjust the polar height. And this is achievable by first losing the clamp on the back. And then you have this screw here. For the very first adjustment, just set the mount to your geographic location by the use of the scale here on the side, depending where you live, and then lock, lock it again in place, and then the mount is ready to go. Maybe when you observe and the object is drifting out of the field very quickly, then you have to readjust the polar alignment but we are talking here only about visual observation, so this is not a real problem. Okay, the other things here. You see I'm turning and moving the telescope around. Uh, maybe you don't want to have this when, when you have an object in, in your field, you don't want to have it movable. Then you can turn these locking screws here. These screws are just pressing a clutch inside that you can't that you can't move the mount anymore so freely. But it is still possible with these uh, axles here. There's also a knob integrated, and here is a warm wheel integrated in, in the mount, and that allows you to make very precise adjustments. Of the position of the telescope, some way like this, and this is also here is also the important knob. Um, the thing is, the Earth is rotating, and therefore the stars are appear to rotate around in the sky, and you want to follow that movement, and you do this by turning this axle here very very gently. It is not that fast, it's very slow, but you have to turn this axle to follow the movement. But you will see this instantly when, when trying it out, you will see how this is working. Okay, now let's come to the next thing. You see this this metal bar here? This is a counterweight. Because of the position here of this whole construction, you have to balance the tube, especially when you assume you point it some way like this, you want to have it stay in place. If here is nothing, then it would just flip around. This is the reason why here a counterweight can be attached or should be attached. You just to, to adjust the balance, you lose the clutch. To be honest, with this super lightweight refractor here, that's not an issue. You barely see it, um, but when you 
adjust the counterweight like this, then it flips. So we put it just in the very innermost position and we have a good balance. And the same goes for the balance in this way. You don't want to have the tube flipping like this or like this. This is where you can use these clamps here to adjust the position of the tube. So this is all working pretty good. Maybe the yeah. So let's keep it this way. Okay. So now we are already come to the top of the telescope, which is of course the most important or the most interesting part, the telescope itself. So here we are talking about a refracting telescope. That means we have a front lens, in this case a two element front lens. Why two elements? With one element, with just one um, lens, you will have extreme amount of color artifacts. So you can't focus it properly, which makes observations really difficult. So a couple of hundred years ago, a guy named Fraunhofer invented the combination of two lenses composed of different materials, flint glass and chrome glass. He put it together, two elements which will collect all wavelengths in one point, in theory. In practice it is not in one point, so we, you will still have little artifacts. So this is where three or even four element lenses come into the play. Here with the beginner telescope we are talking about two lenses, a two element optic that's, uh, that's a good starting point. On the top here you have this plastic dew shield. This is called a dew shield and it is intended to collect the dew. So when you're observing in a cold night then you will have the effect that dew collects on all cold metal surfaces and also glass surfaces. And when you expose the lens to the environment like this the glass will always become covered with dew. Then you have to, to wipe over it or to heat it or something which makes observations not so successful. And with this dew shield you can reduce the effect of collecting the dew heavily because the dew is collected on the outside of this cap. This will help tremendously. You should always use the dew shield. Okay, now let's have a proper look on the back of the telescope. So for visual astronomy you need an eyepiece in the back of the telescope. This is just for projecting the image to have a convenient view into the telescope. And with this knob here you adjust the position of the eyepiece and this is for focusing. Depending on the distance of your object and on the used eyepiece you have to adjust the focus by turning this knob in or out and therefore moving the eyepiece in or out. So for example for a very near terrestrial subject on the horizon or somewhere you have to move it more out and for a stellar object in the sky you have to move it more in. You have here a long range of adjustment and this uh, focuser takes one and a quarter inch eyepieces so the very common standard. You can also exchange the uh, eyepieces that come with the telescope with different ones. Maybe you have already something or you can borrow eyepieces from somewhere because the eyepiece itself is also a very critical part in creating a good image. So the whole back here is made out of plastic. Everything except the axle here but all these the tubes and so on is all plastic. So you can't load the focus it with too heavy load with very big eyepieces. I would not recommend this, so keep it at a very low weight here in the back. So with the telescope you will get three eyepieces, all Huygens design, that's why this H is marked here, Huygens design. A 20 millimeter eyepiece, which gives you 45 time magnification. A 12.5 millimeter eyepiece, which gives you 72 magnification and a 4mm eyepiece, very short one, this will result in 225 times magnification. Regarding magnification, that's always uh, a thing you uh, people ask about how 
big can the magnification be? Well, in theory, you can magnify as you want, but in practice, the magnification is very limited by the telescope itself. So, for this particular telescope here, the maximum magnification you can try is something around 200 times. This is a practical value mostly, and most of the time you will much lower magnifications. Because when magnifying 200 times, you have always the, the field of view is very narrow. You can see only a very narrow field. This is good, for example, when you observe a planet or the surface of the moon, then this is okay. But for all star fields or something, it is super difficult to find your target, to hold it in place and to see something, because the image will also get darker. So when starting with observing, especially star fields, star clusters, you will most of the time use the 20 millimeter eyepiece. And this is just screwed in here. And then you can look through. But now you see already, maybe you see a problem, especially when pointing to a target somewhere high in the sky that makes the observation very problematic. This is where the next accessory is used. This one. This is a sanded mirror. It just reflects the light 90 degree away from the tube. So this comes in the back and then the eyepiece comes into that mirror. And with this combination you have to readjust your focus because it uh, extends the optical path. With this mirror you have a much more convenient uh, way to look in the telescope. Also in sanded positions, in sanded position then it's possible to look through it. But you, I think you see it already with this stock tripod, it is more for designed for kids. So I would have some problems looking through the telescope for a longer time. Okay, so there are now some more parts. The next one is this long tube here. This is called a Barlow lens. The Barlow lens comes also in the back of the telescope. And what this does is it increases the focal length of the telescope by factor 3 for this particular Barlow lens. That means you will get 2700 millimeters focal length. And therefore with the three eyepieces you get three different magnifications, which is pretty cool. but especially for the 12.5 millimeter and the 4 millimeter eyepiece it's nearly useless unfortunately you can try the 12.5 millimeter eyepiece that results in 260 times magnification also for the moon that would be a good idea the next additional element is this green filter here that filter is screwed in the front of the eyepiece and helps you to increase the contrast on planets and also it dims the brightness a bit. Okay, one last accessory to mention is this little tiny little scope. Um, the problem is when, when using this telescope to observe the night sky, even with the lowest magnification of 45 times, it is very difficult to find an object. Again, when you are used to it, if you have it used for a couple of times, then this is possible, but still difficult. The magnification is just too high and the field of your view is too narrow. This is where we use this little finder scope that is just put on the top here in the finder shoe. And this little telescope has a much lower magnification, something around four to six times. And it has a crosshair in it. And what you should do is now point to a terrestrial object, maybe a very distinctive tree on the horizon or, or a house, a building. Use the highest magnification with the four times eyepiece and then have a look through this finder scope and adjust the position of the finder scope by using these three screws here. 
moving them in or out to bring the crosshair in this finder scope exactly onto that same object you're observing through this big telescope. When this is done, ensure that everything is tightened because it can move a bit and then you're good to go. Then you're ready for observing because now you can also, for example, you want to observe a particular star in the sky. You can just um, use this finder scope to point at the star, tighten the clutches, then use maybe the fine adjustment to bring it precisely in the center. And then even with the highest magnification, it should be in your field. If not, no problem. Go a bit lower in magnification with the 20 time eyepiece. Recenter it again that you have it precisely in your frame. And do not forget to always turn the right ascension correction to move it with the stars. Okay, just a couple more things to tell you about telescopes. You will see on the box of the telescope and also on the telescope itself are warning marks. For example, this one here that tells you that you never look into the sun with a telescope. With a telescope without proper filters and I can't emphasize this enough this is really important the thing is you magnify the or you collect intensity of the sunlight into that very little eyepiece and if the if your eye is behind you will get instantly blind that's for sure so don't try this out and the next thing is the parts in the back here of the telescope contains of plastic. So um, you, will in, you will produce much heat, much energy inside the tube and that will let the plastic melt. So you can really destroy your telescope by trying this. If you are interested in observing the sun, then please consider buying a proper sun filter. There are especially solar foil filters are very cheap available. The higher quality glass front filters are a bit more expensive but also very interesting. Herschel prisms are not usable with this telescope. And if you want to have a deeper look into solar observing, feel free to contact us. Look in the shop. There are many solar telescopes available. Okay, so now the last point for this video I want to talk about is expectation versus reality. Especially nowadays, if you're, if you're interested in astronomy and you follow uh, the social media and also some websites, NASA website, whatever, then you will be flooded with insane deep sky images. And when you buy a telescope, you may expect this from your own telescope. But I can tell you that's not working. This is just not the way it's working. The photos you can see online are exposed over multiple hours and then processed in a computer with uh, image processing software or taken with space telescopes. So this is not a comparison. With these small telescopes up to let's say 8 inch in diameter, it is a total different experience. But the cool thing is you experience it by yourself. You see objects by yourself, but they are not as sharp as in these photos. They are maybe a bit blurry, maybe dark, very dim, but every telescope has its own sky. So it's a great experience to, to observe things by yourself with your own eye. That is the cool thing about visual astronomy. So this was a very, very quick and rushed video about our entry level telescope series. I hope you like it. Okay, so far, thank you very much for viewing and see you next time. Bye bye.